Hello, my name is Edna Peterson. Today I am excited to be reading a manuscript entitled Our Muddy Trip, written by one of our local residents, Darlene Kessler. This story is about the animals and landmarks of the Saskatchewan Big Muddy Valley and the events of a junior high school rodeo. I would like to thank Darlene for allowing the Pangman Library to share her story. I will also mention that the author retains all rights to this manuscript and intellectual property and therefore any use or reproduction in any way requires her written permission. Now we will begin. Breakfast is done. We were all up early and anxious to get on the road. Firstly, the checklist. Lots of water, snacks, lunch for a picnic, and of course, our cockapoo Dexter. Upon getting into our SUV, I looked down and noticed that Ocean has sandals on. Please go back and put your hiking boots on. Oh, brother, is the reply. Quickly, she approaches the vehicle again and piles in. After a very short distance, someone yells, my game. Big brother Shane says, shh, we aren't allowed to have them today. Bill and I sigh. A day of kids without their electronics. Trying to make our children notice and appreciate, appreciate nature, I say, watch for animals. Bill speaks next. See the antelope? Samuel, who has been quiet, chips in and says, they look like goats. Yes, they do, murmured Bill. It's a bright sunny day, so it feels good to be spending the day with the family. We talk the hill, looking down into the big muddy. We hear awe in unison. All goes quiet as we appreciatively scan the view. There has been lots of rain this summer, so the valley is green and beautiful. Slowly, we descend to the valley flat and look around at all the different shaped hills. Bill explains, some of these hills are called eskers, which were formed by glaciers millions of years ago. The black coloring on the face of the hills could be strips of coal deposits. Many years ago, there were several coal mines in the area. There is still a large one at Coronac, just west of here. Driving slowly along the valley bottom, we see a doe and her small fawn. Curious, the fawn steps from behind a sagebrush and stands as still as a statue. We drive past a slough. The reeds on the perimeter are thick. We see red-winged blackbirds, mallard ducks, Canada geese, and one of my favorites, a great blue heron. A little further along is a cock and hen pheasant. Then, a great horned owl sitting in a dead tree. Near the tree, there is a long abandoned house. Snooping around, there is a red fox. It crawls under the house. Rolling along slowly, we spy a kit fox, which jumps from the inside of the house to a windowless opening. I think that is where it lives. Isn't it pretty, says Ocean. Sure is, I reply. We turn off the highway onto a gravel road, and of course, someone asks, why are we turning? I smile and say, you'll see. As we drive, a flock of birds runs off the road and take flight. What are those? asks Shane. It's a covey of partridges, Bill answers. Soon, we are at the base of one of the most famous hills in southern Saskatchewan, Castle Butte. The children bound out of the vehicle. Dexter bounces with excitement, glad to be out of the car. The chatter starts. Can we climb it? Look, there's a cave. Let's go in. Again, can we? Can we climb it? Well, I hesitate to tease. Go ahead, but be careful. I, having climbed the hill many times, stay back. Not sure climbing would be the best thing for my ankle that was operated on eight weeks prior. I walk the perimeter of the old hill, taking my time. 
enjoying every inch of the crumbling butte. They all spend a long time surveying the view in all directions from the top. I can barely hear their laughs. I return to the vehicle to have a snack and a drink of water. I think to myself, they will come down thirsty, as by now it has become very warm. Everyone comes down much more slowly than they went up. The descent is steep and one has to take care. I hear a few oh ohs and a scream from ocean. Holy, what a view from up there, says Shane. Boy, am I thirsty. It's very breezy up there. Ocean thought Dexter might blow over the edge, chuckles Bill. Grab water, everyone, I said. Let's run around the big hill, suggests Ocean. Race ya, says her brother, as he bumps her on the shoulder. You wait for her, I strongly state. They come back laughing and panting, ready for more water. Shane says, let's go in the caves. Sure, let's, is the reply. Sam and Shane head toward one of the caves Bill and I go to another. Ocean hangs back snacking. Only a few feet in, it cools off dramatically and is pitch black. Bill turns a flashlight on, but it only helps him as he leads the way. As we venture further, the cave narrows. We look up and see a slice of light. Suddenly we hear a scream. We know it is Ocean. Quickly, we start backing out of the narrow passageway and can finally turn and proceed forward. Once outside, we hesitate to allow our eyes to adjust to the light. We see Ocean, hands in the air and staring at the ground. I have a strong suspicion of what it is. I run to her, dragging Bill, as he doesn't like snakes either. Her brothers bound toward us just in time to see the big bull snake slithering away. Awesome, says Sam. Ocean's heart is beating double time and her body is quivering. I try to console her as she sobs on my shoulder. He is long gone, says Bill. Shortly, she recovers and wants to go in a cave with her brothers. She only ventures in a short distance and thinks she would rather not continue. We start off for Big Beaver. Heading south, we see a point of interest. Bill, please stop so we can read that Karen, I say. The Karen title is The Willow Bunch Big Muddy Trail. It states the many groups that use the trail, settlers, NWMP, outlaws, sitting bull, etc. What is the NWMP? asks one. Bill answers, Northwest Mounted Police. They were the authorities in the West before the RCMP was formed in 1920. Another question pops up. Who is Sitting Bull? I have to think a moment. Finally, the information comes to me. Sitting Bull was a Lakota chief who led his people in resistance to the United States government. He crossed into Canada for sanctuary, but was eventually taken back to the American authorities, put on a reservation, and was later killed resisting arrest. He was only 59 years old. It was a long time ago. Going south, then west, we turn off the pavement, pavement, and soon we see dozens of trucks, trailers, campers, people, and horses. Hey, I know what this is. My friend Jay will be here. It is the junior and senior high school rodeo. Can we watch? Says Shane. Bill and I glance at one another. As a typical parent, Bill says, we'll see. First we go to the store, then we have lunch. Another thing we have neglected to do with our kids is to take them to rodeos, which as we grew up were a large part of our family's summer entertainment. My dad roped and rode Bronx, one of my brothers rode bulls and Bronx, and I barrel raced. We park in front of the old false fronted store and enter. <clears throat> it is packed to the high ceilings with groceries, t-shirts, boots, ropes, spurs, puzzles, work clothes, and anything one can think of. The kids wander around, taking in every inch, chattering away. Bill and I wander through the store. The old hardwood floors creak as we step into an extension of the store. For myself, I pick up some soft leather gloves, 
a puzzle, my favorite bacon, and a very unique necklace. Bill smiles and says, hey, I think that is enough for you. Bill tries on hoodies, chooses a couple, and a t-shirt. Suddenly, the store is swarming with teenagers. I grab t-shirts for each of us and call to the kids. They come to us arms full of various items. I smile and ask Ocean and Sam to put the riding boots back. We exit the store and Shane looks up and says, that sign is true. If we don't have it, you don't need it. We head back to our vehicle and then to a small picnic area across from the store. It is packed with campers of all sizes. I unpack the cooler, chicken, salad, cheese sticks, chips, cookies, plates and utensils. We all dig in, hungry after a busy morning. We just start munching. Actually, the kids seem to be gobbling their food. Slow down, explains Bill. Okay, the children mumble. Dexter yips and Bill quiets him. We hear someone approaching. It is Sean's friend, Jay. He shyly saunters over to us and Shane does the introduction. Jay says, I saw your vehicle pull in, so I brought you a program. Rodeo starts in 45 minutes. You are coming, aren't you? The kids look at Bill and then me. There is a pause. We nod yes, which brings a smile to everyone's face. I scan the program. There are lots of participants. Shane asks Jay, what events are you in? Jay lists them off. Saddle bronc, bareback bronc, breakaway roping, and team roping. Holy, Shane exclaims. That's nothing. My older brother Logan is in six events tomorrow. Gee, I better get going. My parents will be looking for me. We will be over shortly, says Bill. In a steel panel corral a short distance from us, the Bronx are jostled around, are jostling around. They are playfully snorting, rearing, and kicking. Ocean asks, why are those horses acting so goofy? I answer, they are excited in anticipation of their coming event. Most of these young people will have a few butterflies in their stomachs too. I notice there are Appaloosas, bays, paints, sorrels, and the odd Palomino and buckskin. Most are crossed with the draft horse. They seem to be a smaller version of what would one would see at an amateur or pro professional rodeo. Lunch is done, so we wander over to the rodeo grounds and take a seat on the old wooden bleachers. Bill chuckles and says, don't move around too much as you may get a sliver in your butt. Dexter pulls at his leash and barks excitedly at all the commotion, but then settles in the shade beneath us. Bill fills his water dish and gives him a treat. Zane, the announcer says, Rodeo time. The first event is saddle bronc riding. One after another, the boys are tossed in the dirt. Then it is Jay's turn. He must stay on his bronc for six seconds. The chute opens. The bronc lunges out. Jay rides well in time with the horse. The whistle blows and the pickup man comes to his side pulls him off and gently places him on the ground. Phew, I like that, says Sh Sam. Boy, that man is strong, exclaims Shane. Jay scores an 81. Great, but there are more riders to come. The next two opponents also make the whistle. One scores an 83 and one a 79. Jay is pleased with second place, but is already preparing for the bareback bronc event. Jay is bucked off, but he jumps up and brushes himself off. There is a pause in the events. I look around and notice an ambulance in place behind the chutes, ready to respond if someone gets hurt. The next event is chute dogging. We don't know anyone in this event, so we are not paying much attention. Jay's next event is breakaway roping. He is mounted on a beautiful blue roan. The horse prances as he enters the arena and the roping box. Jay settles his mount and focuses on the chute. He nods for his calf, out it scats and runs down the arena. Jay skillfully throws a loop around the calf's neck. 
Once the slack of the rope becomes taut, it breaks the string fastened to the saddle horn. The white flag flies in the air, which indicates his time to the judges. Jay is very fast, but another boy has a better time by a half second. It has continued to get hotter and dustier. At one point, a dust devil comes whirling across the width of the arena and pelts us with dirt, grass, and small pieces of paper. We only have time to turn away, not escape it. Yuck, said Ocean. What was that? The clown act is next. A young boy named Cash does some tricks with his pony, Pete, and his Jack Russell Terrier, Mickey. At the end of his act, Pete lays flat on the ground and Cash pretends to snooze beside him and Mickey. They all rise and take a bow. The children giggle all through the antics. Ocean says, I like that. He was funny. Yes, he did well and will improve as he gets older, I say. It is very hot by now. Why don't you take your sister to the concession for ice cream, I suggest. They seem to be gone a long time, but finally come back, come trailing back. Ocean appears with Jay's little sister, Lyric, and Sam with a friend from school. They run around playing, half watching the rodeo. Bill and I enjoy each event. Many memories come to me. I think, gee, to be young again. The barrel racing is about to start and Ocean and Lyric are back beside me. Ocean asks, why are all these girls dressed in long sleeves when it is so hot? To her question, I reply, all the participants are required to wear long sleeved Western shirts tucked in, jeans and Western boots with a heel and Western hat or helmet. Oh, that seems like a lot of rules to follow, says Lyric. The first young girl's horse runs well, a good time for her. The second girl knocks over the second barrel, which gives her a five second penalty. Next in the arena is an out of control sorrel that does not does most of the cloverleaf pattern, but loses his footing on the third barrel and falls. The horse jumps up and heads towards the gate. The girl remains on the ground, gripping her right leg. The ambulance enters the arena. She sits up crying, but waves the EMTs off. With a little assistance, she rises and everyone cheers as she hobbles out. Oh my gosh, Lyric exclaims. I hope she is okay. Bill and I reassure her. I thought I might want to do that someday, but maybe not, says Lyric. Goat tying is the next event. The girls on their horses rush down the arena to a tethered goat. They quickly dismount, grab the tether, and do their best to tie three legs with their pegging string. Goats are ornery, wiry little animals. The girls giggle. They must be strong little things, says Ocean. I have never tied, I have never tried goat tying and don't think it would be my cup of tea, I reply. The kids down to leave. Bill says, the rodeo will soon be over, so please meet us at the SUV when it ends. Team roping is next, Jay's last event. Jay is the header and catches quickly. The healer comes in and catches two hawks. At the end, Jay and his partner place third. The rodeo is finished, so Bill, Dexter, and I go to the vehicle. Bill starts it as it is sweltering inside. We wait and wait. It may not have been that long, but I want to get on the road. I am getting exasperated. Bill, not so much. Calm down and quit pacing, exclaims Bill. First comes Ocean. Face grubby, clothes worse. <clears throat> Next is Shane. Sorry, I was talking to Jay and his friends. Bill indicates all is fine. Finally, Sam appears. He has blood on his shirt and a three-corner tear on his left sleeve. How did you manage that? I shout. Mom, it is only a scratch from the barbed wire. Bill's look means lay off. I take a deep breath and say, get in. Sam looks over to see the sign, Nature Center. Hey. We didn't get to see that. 
Another time, says Bill, there's lots more to visit, the outlaw caves, the effigies, the hundred-year-old school, and more. We are only on the road a short while, and I look back and see that Ocean is already dozing on her big brother's shoulder. He grins. Sometimes he pretends that he doesn't like her very much, but he loves her dearly. We whisper to Shane and Sam, look at that sunset. Wow, they reply, nothing like a Saskatchewan sunset. We don't go much further and Samuel, Samuel is sound asleep, a very quiet vehicle. A coyote dashes across the highway in the headlights. I look back to speak to Shane now he isn't replying either. In a short while, we pull into the driveway. Bill and I get out and try to arouse the kids. Groans are all we hear. Half awake, they head to the showers and are soon comfy in their beds. We unpack, clean up, and head to, our, to put our sleepy heads down 